Hello! If you're watching this, you're either a student in my Spring 2020 History of Industrial Design class at Rhode Island School of Design, or for some other reason you found it and feel like watching it. We're transitioning to online digital format. This is the first one, and this is super clumsy because I wasn't expecting to do this for another week, but so many people have left earlier than expected that I wanted to offer options. So I am not rehearsing this. I am not editing this. This will be a hot mess. I did put on a jacket and tie, but that doesn't mean I'm wearing pants. So this is the Art Deco Lecture, week five, History of Industrial Design. And I will interrupt occasionally because normally this is the week where I would have brought in great things to see in class. So I have them with me here instead. Okay, let's see how this goes. Also, I'm using the computer microphone. I'm combining technologies because I don't have the right equation yet to do this effectively and easily, but also with a reasonable quality. These are classic Art Deco movies. In addition to being wildly entertaining and super compelling, they express visually a lot of the themes we're going to look at in today's class. The Art Deco period is a really complex period. A lot was happening. After World War I, there was a long era of prosperity. All of the manufacturing that we had been hinting at in the Art Nouveau period and through the Industrial Revolution finally became an actual tool for manufacturing things in quantity. But then the Great Depression happened with the stock market crash of 1929, which plunged the world into this global economic meltdown that lasted all the way until the start of World War II in 1939. So huge prosperity and progress followed by a really long 10-year period of total deprivation. In America alone, there was 25% unemployment, up to 33% globally. Crop values dropped as much as 60%. And then prohibition, so no drinking alcohol, was a governmental legal action that happened in America, 1920 to 1933, but then also in Canada, Russia, Iceland, Norway, Hungary, Finland, so around the world for a variety of reasons. As a result, the Art Deco period is infused with a real sincere need for escape. It totally defines the era, so keep that in mind with everything we're looking at. A lot of people were just trying to find a way to sort of uh, imagine a brighter future. That sense of escape, the reality of travel, and the emotional sort of uh, release is really a big part of what was happening. The Art Nouveau style, which we looked at last week, was the first sort of style that had no historical references. It wasn't trying to be Greek Revival or Gothic Revival. And th there's a very different thing happening in the Art Deco period, which is the first modern style but there are lots of references to older cultures. So there's a funny exploring of how do you make objects that, that uh, stand on their own. But one thing that all Art Deco objects celebrate is the arrival at a new world and a new way of doing things. The Art Deco style was everywhere and it was everywhere really quickly. In November of 1918, the armistice was signed ending World War I, which didn't really mean that the problems of World War I went away. There were 37 million casualties, 16 million people died, 21 million more were wounded. 11% of France's entire population was killed or wounded. So everywhere you looked, there was evidence that this horrible war had just happened. It was also the first war to be completely photographed. So there were photographs of the Civil War and the Crimean War, but they were staged photographs because there were glass plate photography, which took longer. This war was photographed on all of that new role film that we were looking at last week. And as a result, it was much more evident and, and present in people's minds visually, which brings something to life in a, in a really compelling way. So there was this determination after the war that the atrocities of that war should never happen again. Uh, the people who created it are 
bad people. We're not those people. Let's make a whole new world, a new way of doing everything. So after the war, there's a real interest in doing things that are modern in a very different way. Total break from the past. Also, there's this funny thing that happens in war with technology and progress. Any of the German patents for new plastics created in laboratories were confiscated and sold to American companies like DuPont. So a lot of the technologies, uh, including lighter than air travel with Zeppelins, got shared through conquest. And that launched a lot of new innovation after the war. But during the war, there was four years of really serious privation. As a result, after the war, there was a real need to celebrate the survival, the end of rationing. FYI also, if any of you are interested in service design, which I know you are, take a look at rationing systems. World War I, there was not enough food, so the government invented methods of sharing that food in a controlled way, through booklets, through coupons, and those systems are really interesting precursors to some things that we're probably going to end up needing back in our lives at some point soon. These are two very, very high-end handmade objects, so it's a little unfair to even show them to make this story. But I think there's there, but I think they're really good evidence of the sort of desperate need for something fun after the war. Designers were right there to realize that pent up frustration with privation and make some crazy stuff. So there's this balancing in the Art Deco period of serious concerns and meaningful progress, but also like boozy party fun. You did an okay job last week giving me adjectives that described what was happening in the Art Nouveau period. I had adjectives for like organic and foliate and lavish and tensile and flowy. And you gave me, um, what was the adjective? Uh, stretched gum-ish. And I, I will allow that as an adjective. Pretty good one for this style. But look at the difference. Where we're going to go this week is completely different. So if we were meeting in person, I would ask you to throw out adjectives now and describe this to me. I mean, even wherever you are now, on an airplane on your way home, on a train, stuck somewhere, in the bathroom, I don't know, throw out an adjective. Uh, in your own brain, you should have some description of what this looks like. But whatever you do use, you can see in these images all sorts of visual references to things like electrification, mechanization, transportation. There are zigzags and sunbursts and lightning bolts and chevrons, which are a sort of stacked V-shapes. Things are tall and everything is shiny. First, let's just look at why this might be the way things look. What are some of the factors that contributed to this aesthetic, which is so easy to identify visually? The first thing would have to be a newfound, complete obsession with speed. New materials, luxury, travel were all really important. The world was, I hate when people say the world was moving at a faster pace. It always goes the same. It always just feels faster. But global transportation had really sped up. So we looked a couple of weeks ago at the, the rocket train, which could go 15 miles an hour and then 36 miles an hour with Stevenson's train development. Imagine suddenly you can be in a race car. You can be on a speeding train going 75 miles an hour. The speed that was available to people was increased. And as a result, there was an interest in travel, in the speed of travel, but also the sort of exotic allure of where that travel would get you. So in the Art Deco period, there's... There's a lot of interest in other cultures working into designed objects. Also, before the crash, there was a big building boom. And last week, we looked at the arrival of elevators and steel. Imagine what that does to the skyline. Suddenly, there are huge, tall buildings everywhere. There's an economic prosperity that's allowing lots of new construction. So even in non-skyscrapers, there are references to construction and height and verticality and the angularity of, of urban construction. The drawings on the top are by Hugh Ferris, who's an important part of defining the aesthetic of this period. He was hired to help explore what the new zoning restrictions in New York City meant. People were worried that tall buildings would block out light getting to the sidewalks. And so zoning laws introduced the idea of setting back a building to allow air and light to, all the way down to the sidewalk. But architects didn't necessarily know how to interpret that. So Hugh Ferris produced a whole series of these really evocative and wonderful massing studies to figure out what a building might look like. Last week we looked at the earliest printed promotions and packaging and talked about how food became a commodity in the Art Nouveau period and how that changed the equation of consumption and, and uh, faith in the supplier and an understanding of where things were coming from. 
That continues in the Art Deco period, but times a thousand. And it's a little unfair of me to compare cornflakes to face powder, but I think this image gives you a sense of how radically the, the same equation developed. Uh, so it's, it's printed ink on paper wrapped around something you could buy, and it becomes a really fully mature aesthetic expression in the Art Deco period. Designers have really learned how to grab attention with bold patterns and color contrast and images, and this style is in evidence everywhere, partly because so many things that you could consume were covered in printed paper that expressed this style. So that Art Nouveau ability to print packaging didn't really contribute a lot to the aesthetic of the Art Nouveau. It was new technology at the time, but in the Art Deco period, it really starts to work as one equation. Let's look now at why this happened and what contributed to the creation of the new style. So you understand what it looked like, a little bit of sort of what was making it happen, but I really want to do a deeper dive into how did this develop and how did people find out about it. And as we've looked at the last two weeks, global expositions are a big part of it. If you want to be super fancy or if your French is good, this is the actual title of the show in Paris in 1925. I, because I'm posting this on the internet, am not going to use my bad French and be made fun of in the comments. So I'm going to point out that you could translate it into English, but it's still a crazy long name that I don't know anyone who even uses. Uh, or you could just call it that Art Deco show for, that happened in Paris in 1925. But honestly, everyone I know just calls it Paris 1925. This was a really interesting global exposition in the same model as the Crystal Palace and everything else we looked at last week. But there are some really telling differences. In 1910, the Paris Salon d'Automne introduced Cubism to the world. That's why we remember it today. But there was also a display of German products there produced through the Deutsche Werkbund. So machine-made objects that were made with the participation of industry and artists and designers in the formula that the Deutsche Werkbund was trying to get working in Germany. And the exhibition was so popular that police came in to control the crowds. So the French, French realized that they were losing ground in terms of progress and modernity, and they needed to fix this. In 1912, in response, the government announced that they would be having a show in 1915 where they would reassert the French supremacy. But then World War I interfered. When the war ended, they could then resume the plans for this show, and it didn't happen until 1925. So there was a really long sort of baking time to make this amazing cake that, that introduced Art Deco to the world. You can see this, I think it's a postcard, from the exposition, uh, and the campus looks very different than any of the others we looked at. And to help you understand the contrast, in the back, in the center, and I don't know how to do this digitally, I, don't, I can't leap in front of the screen and point, and I don't have a laser pointer, but you see an older looking building at the center at the top, and that's the Grand Palais, which was built for the 1900 Paris Expo, out of iron and glass in that older way, and it's really different looking than the newer buildings in the foreground. Those buildings were all built by and for department stores. So there's another really interesting change in what this exposition was doing. The Crystal Palace exposition was countries showing what they could do. The Paris exposition that we looked at last week was suddenly uh, companies, Tiffany and Gorham, showing off what they could do and representing their country in the process. And suddenly department stores are sort of the, the anchoring spots for this show. So commerce matters in a much bigger way than it ever has before. An interesting thing that, that I just want to plant the seed for while we're looking at this image is that Germany didn't exhibit at this show. There were two countries that I want to mention that were not present here as exhibitors. One was Germany because they had just been defeated in the war, so they weren't allowed uh, to participate, but the other was the United States, because the call for this exhibition was that the work be unreservedly modern. And Herbert Hoover was then our Secretary of Commerce, and he decided we were really good at making things like filing cabinets and luggage, but no nothing we did was unreservedly modern, because we didn't even really understand decoration or design. So we didn't participate, but importantly, he created a commission to visit the expo and prepare a report for American manufacturers. So 87 de delegates from industry and publishing and education and museums visited in the summer of 1925 to check out what was happening at this Paris exposition, and they published a report in America that really lit a spark and got American manufacturers thinking about things differently. 
Tens of thousands of Americans visited the show and remember the ships we started looking at last week, the huge Art Nouveau era steel hulled turbine powered ships allowed people to do that. Many more people could travel to see this show. And the American Association of Museums, after the show was over, organized a touring exhibition with over 400 items from this exposition. So this was really influential because the works on view at this show looked unlike anything the world had seen before. A French magazine wrote, all the works of art collected here show a family resemblance which cannot fail to be noticed by even the least prepared visitors. And you can see just in this collection image of things on view at that exposition, how easy that is to understand. Everything looks really similar in a way that we really hadn't seen before at an exposition. Hopefully you read Helen Appleton Reed. If you didn't, maybe this will inspire you to do that. I want to give you some of the things she wrote as part of the report on the 1925 exposition for an American audience, because I think hearing her language and seeing these images together really brings the ideas to life. She wrote, gone is all carving and superimposed decoration. Interest and variety must depend upon the application of color and flat design or the quality of beauty existing in the unadorned material. So no more carved grapes, no more carved, uh, what are all the things we saw in the Crystal Palace catalog? Uh, dog arms, griffins, dolphins, whatever. No animals carved into things, no leaves, no tendrils. Unlike the Art Nouveau, there's no whiplash curves. Very simple geometry that's allowing the material to, and the form to be the story. I should have done, I didn't do my normal disclaimer at the beginning that this is a hot mess of different chapters shoved together. There are a whole bunch of people I want you to know a little bit more about. So I'm using them to promote the larger, to advance the larger narrative and give them a little bit of a spotlight, but it will seem a little chaotic as a result. And if you're not someone who's been through this class so far and you're just watching this for some reason I don't understand, um, you're gonna think this is just really badly organized, but I promise you that there's a logic so just um, cut me some slack. We're working in crisis mode, okay? Uh, I want you to know about Emile Jacques Ruhlman. If this were furniture history, we would stop here for a really long time. There's so much to learn from his work. It's all handmade. It's all a celebration of very high-end materials and craftsmanship. But Ruhlman was brilliant at playing with proportion and scale and pattern in a really meaningful way that I think could be useful in product design. Here's an interior on the right and, and a piece of furniture that was on view at the exposition on the left. Ruhlman's interiors especially, but also all of his furniture, do crazy manipulation of scale. There's a total hierarchy created by having things that should look tall look small, by having a ceiling that's quite low look higher by, by being stepped and then opening up in the middle, by using uh, imitation vertical curtains on the wall. There are all sorts of things that are just challenging your understanding of the scale of the space and the relationship between the different shapes in it. His ability to play with that hierarchy in, in an intentional way is really exciting to me. So the cabinet on the right from a distance would just look like a rectangle with some dots. And when you get up closer, you realize it's actually a rectangle with teeny little legs on its own pedestal. And the dots aren't dots, they're squares. And then you get a little closer and you see that in the background, which I'm sure is hard to see uh, in this slide, are uh, inlaid sort of bubbles. There's circles all over it. So what Roman's doing is giving you some reward at every distance and in many ways drawing you in and saying, you might want to come closer. It's probably worth looking at this detail. I think there's so much to take away from that if you're looking at, if you're doing web design, for example, a good website design doesn't just make the information available to you, it leads you down the path so that you can get the information you need in a series of smaller decisions. And Ruhlman's work all does that with distance and attention grabbing. So take a look at his work more, I think especially if you're gonna just be interested in hierarchy and narrative without having products attached to that. Ruhlman wrote, I work on the principle that nothing that can be done by machine should be done by hand. Handmade should look handmade. And here's another quotation from Helen Appleton Reed because I think it pairs with his work especially well. It is characteristic of the new decor that the nature of the material is at all times respected and is allowed to dictate its treatment. Wood is wood, iron, iron. 
The bad taste that invariably ensues when the attempt is made to give the quality of one material to another, to make wood look like iron or marble look like lace, is avoided. So I don't know if you remember, but last week we looked at the Eiffel Tower when it was new in 1889 and how it was intended to be an, a beacon for the fairground. It was covered in arc lighting that lit up the whole fairground and, and announced where it was at great distances. Well, it was still there in the 1900 exposition where they put the Grand Rue uh, near it to have some newer thing because that, that sad old Eiffel Tower was still there. It's still there for the 1925 Expo. And the way it's modernized this time is by advertising. Andre Citroen rented it and added 2,000, no, not 2,000, 250,000 light bulbs to it. This is the triumph of 19th century engineering transformed into a huge ad for 20th century consumerism. And amazingly, that Citroen lighting stayed on until 1934. So I want to look a little bit at the influence of this show because it was very specifically French. The aesthetic that was developed was French, but it influenced what everyone was doing around the world. So I want to shift to America and talk about what happened here. After the expo, department stores organized shows and brought work that was on view at the show to America so that people could see it, but then they also commissioned objects to sell. It's a really brilliant strategy. You don't have to go to Paris to see this stuff, we'll bring it to you. And if you fall in love with it and you can't afford the Léon Géod original on the left, which is shark, shark skin, chagrin, uh, lacquer, it's incredibly complex construction to get the chevron shaped legs and the, the angled miter in the front of the drawers all to fit perfectly, to set the top of the desk into all those angles. Very, very high-end handmade thing. But they commissioned a designer who, I've seen many different attributions to this desk. The one I like is Donald Desky, but at any rate, they commissioned an American designer to make a knockoff version, which you could say how sad that we're selling knockoffs, but if you look at it, it's a really lovely reinterpretation that removes what made the original expensive. So flat front drawers, the case works much easier to assemble. It's all just painted one color. The backboard is removed, so there's no setting in of angles to happen. Uh, and that's what American department stores were doing. Sell some pieces inspired by the originals. Paul Frankel designed work for Abraham and Strauss. Ruhlman's work was on view at Lord & Taylor and Altman's. Lelou and DEM were at Macy's. This is one step farther than the immersive experience of department stores that we were looking at with the Art Nouveau last week. This is actually commissioned work and organized shows. They're functioning in tandem with museums and as museums. And it wasn't a small effort. The Lord & Taylor show attracted 200,000 people. The Macy's exhibition attracted 100,000 people. So a lot of people were introduced to Paris 1925 through New York 1928. And this was, at the time, a really European sensibility. This was an imported aesthetic that we were trying to figure out how to assimilate. Some artists were especially well positioned to cash in on this because they came from Europe and they already knew the sensibility or they were just more attuned to how to, how to reduce it for American consumption. The fancy French ideas were pretty quickly assimilated into something more mainstream in America. Paul Frankel is a great example of this. He moved to New York from Vienna. He had trained as an architect uh, and he opened a gallery in New York called Frankel Galleries on 48th Street, and he started a company called Skyscraper Furniture, which became the epicenter of American modernism. You can see what his references were. He called his company Skyscraper Furniture because he made furniture that looked like skyscrapers. Here's another Hugh Ferris drawing in the middle. I think it might be the one that's actually at the RISD Museum, and I'm sorry to say I can't go check because it's also currently closed. Uh, at any rate, there is a beautiful Hugh Ferris drawing that you can go see at some point when you return. Frankel wrote, modernism means style versus styles. So you're not looking at the Gothic revival or Greek revival or some other culture. You're making up a new thing that's stylish and modern. Frankel's trajectory is very similar to a lot of other ones we're going to look at. Well, no. It's similar to a few we'll look at today and almost all of the other ones that I don't have time to help us look at today. Before the Depression, he was making high-end luxury items. So the clock on the left is made with, with enamel and uh, 
nickel or chrome plated metal. It's a very expensive clock. It sold for $50 in its day and people made fun of it. They called it the $50 clock. That might not sound like a lot to you, but that's about $800 today. So it's a pretty high end thing. But then when the depression happened, suddenly the manufacturer was sort of out of luck. Like nobody's gonna spend that on a clock anymore. So they brought Frankel back in to design a more affordable version and he made the clock on the right. And I think this is a really beautiful comparison of the before and after that, that helps explain why the profession of industrial design flourished so completely in this era. In the boom times of the 1920s, we needed designers to make things and there was a lot of commercial competition and design was being used to help elevate objects and win customers. But then during the depression, those same designers had to shift what they were doing and figure out ways to create more aesthetics and more function and more uh, utility with less material use and less manufacturing. So the clock on the right is plastic and it sold for something more like $5. And that, I'm gonna use that as a clumsy transition to the next chapter. The style got out in a really big public way. I want to look at some of the factors that led to that style. And as you know with me, it's sort of always materials and technology first. Some of this is clumsy, but I just need to have shown you this. Uh, last week, I did a bad job talking about Art Nouveau glass and how grinding wheels might have been part of what created that sort of underwater aesthetic. A lot of those old companies from the Art Nouveau period are still around in the Art Deco period in the same way that we looked at Arthur Silver's wallpapers going from Victorian geometry to Art Nouveau anti-geometry, suddenly in the Art Deco period, someone like Lalique making glass could take the same techniques of intaglio cutting and grinding wheels and change the approach and make it more geometric, use fewer layers of colored glass, uh, control the equation a little bit differently. I'm more interested in where new materials and technologies starting, are starting to change the equation. Hey, I'm really sorry if I'm stuttering and not editing this out and leaving all of the ums. Just have a little bit of patience. Again, this is, a, this is hot mess, Matthew. I put on a tie, but that's all I could manage. The Victorian efforts that we looked at to arrive at man-made materials, Alexander Parks with Parkesine, Goodyear with his rubber, were people taking materials from nature and finding a way to affect them in a laboratory to make them moldable. That started to lead to real progress working in the laboratory to make new materials. So secoid, which is cellulose acetate, was compression molded cellulose. Cellulose is a cotton derivative, uh, which is also what parkesine was. But it's starting to change and be less extracted from nature and more created in a laboratory. And what I like is that that starts to be a high-end thing. So Lalique is using cellulose acetate to make very, very fancy molded plastic uh, compact boxes, powder, face powder boxes, which are still going to cost less than the glass ones that he was making. Uh, but then that very same material can be extruded into a sheet uh, and have glue added to the back and sliced up and turned into scotch tape. So high-end, low-end, new materials, all sorts of things are changing in this time period. But for me, the real technology that arrived that's important that we need to care about is radio. It is impossible for us to understand how radio changed things. But I keep beating you over the heads with things like, with statements like, uh, remember, if you needed music, you had to learn to play the violin or have a friend that did. Recorded music changed that. So you could now buy a fancy Victrola and buy records. But imagine if you only had to buy the radio once and you had free music for, for life. It really made community and music and news and lots of things available to many, many more people and advanced the global communication that led to all other progress that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. In 1920, Marconi produced the first advertised public broadcast and that was Dame Nellie Melba singing. None of you know what that means or care, uh, but check her out. She was a very famous Australian opera singer and Peaches Melba and Melba Toast are named after her. In 1920, RCA obtained the first commercial broadcast license and 1921 was the first commercial broadcast. Of course, it was a sports event. And 1927 was the first American coast to coast radio broadcast, which again was sports. It was the Rose Bowl. But this sludge shows you how the transition in equipment happened really quickly. In 1922, a radio was a piece of equipment. You had to be a fanatic. I just realized I'm sitting here talking to myself. So if I hiccup, I don't care.
I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to the internet and I should be more polite. What were we talking about? Right. Uh, radios. The, the woman on the left is a radio fanatic. She knows how to use that piece of equipment, but nobody else could figure it out. The woman on the right has an easy to use radio, which is now housed in a beautiful piece of furniture that matches her furniture and can be out in the living room, not hidden away somewhere. But that transition was really clumsy. On the bottom, you can see a whole bunch of experiments to figure out what is a radio. Does it look like a desk? Does it look like a Victrola? How do we arrive at a landscape of design where a radio is a thing. It happened really rapidly and really completely. By 1929, over 10 million families owned radios, and Americans were spending $850 million a year on radio equipment. Remember this image for next week. It's a really beautiful one. If we were in class, I would ask you to identify three things that are unusual to us in this image, three things that look interesting or surprising. I hope that you can spot all three. The first is there's a conveyor belt in the middle of the table. So these people are putting stuff together and there's some moving aspect that's helping them assemble things more effectively. We're gonna take a deep dive into that world next week and look at how we designed assembly systems. But the other thing I hope you noticed is that these are all women working in factories, which we've looked at in the industrial revolution and after, but is a, another big part of this era. And then where are the men in this picture? They're standing there and watching, just like we always do. We're gonna look at this next week also because suddenly we were rationalizing how things are made and teasing out the worker from the manager. But I just wanted to put this slide in to help you appreciate the insides of a radio and how, how quickly we were figuring out how to understand the outsides. So by 1930, radios were actually designed, not just produced. It wasn't just a fake Victrola or a wooden box with some curvy things on it. They were really beautiful, sculptural, uh, confident objects. And certainly that's going to be true in traditional materials like wood and glass, but it's going to be even more true when we start introducing plastic into radios. Plastic is moldable. You don't make a lump of plastic and then reduce it. So there are a lot of different opportunities for how, what the shapes can look like. Any of you who were slash are taking metals too and have used the bridge port can recognize in these radios some opportunities that, that you would take advantage of to produce the molds. So the mold is carved in a big block of metal. A bridge port can very easily do parallel stripes. It can do uh, certain rounded corners. Uh, use a, a round bit. So a lot of why these radios look the way they do is the aesthetic of the Art Deco period. We want these horizontal bands, but most of it is that's an effective way to make a mold, to mold plastic. At the same time, that's a really convenient form for a radio because the vacuum tubes inside produce a, a tremendous amount of heat, which can vent out through the horizontal bands in the back and produce sound out the front where the speakers are. So those openings in the housing are easy to make in the mold, but really convenient for combining the housing and the interior components. And plastic was a good material for this. In 1929, the plastics directory in America included 84 trade names for American plastics, but by 1934, there were 250 different plastics. So plastics are gonna really enter our conversation rapidly. And I hope you read, and if you didn't, you should, the Bell Kogan interview in Industrial Design Reader because she talks really extensively and and I think quite elegantly about the arrival of plastics. If we get Pachakachas to post, student presentations to post, you can see one about Bakelite. I want you to be aware of polyoxybenzylmethylenglycolonhydride because isn't that a fun word to say? And look, I invented a fancy way to help you say it with me. So wherever you are watching this, you must say this with me now. Polyoxybenzylmethylenglycolonhydride. That is the fancy chemical name for Bakelite, invented in 1907 by Leo Bakeland, who is a Belgian chemist. It won the race for the first truly synthetic plastic. Bakelite had no direct analog in nature, so it wasn't a, a plant material that we reprocessed. It was made in a laboratory. It was made of phenol derived from coal, coal tar and formaldehyde derived from wood alcohol. And one of the reasons Bakelite was so 
successful is that it's electrically non-conductive and it's heat resistant. So it was perfect for radio housings, telephone casings, electrical components, insulation. And then also it was colorful or could be colorful. So it worked decoratively as well. We're going to look more at Bakelite when we get to plywood because it's an important part of that story. But think about what you need to mold plastic. You need draft angle, you need rounded corners, you need a way for the liquid plastic to flow through all parts of the mold before it hardens. So you could say that Italian designers with a flair for amazing form created this incredible radio. You could also say an understanding of how the mold would work led to this radio. Same thing with Wells Coates in England with the round radio or the radio let from Australia. They're all cast Bakelite and those forms are classically Art Deco. They're also the inevitable end result of using polished metal and casting liquid plastic into it. Bakelite takes us back to this technology that we looked at last week. Bakelite transformed what a telephone could be, and it's a bumpy road to figure this out. The first Bakelite phone was made in America. It was the American AE-1A in 1925, but that's not really a fully functioning telephone because there's a big wooden box in the hallway with the ringer. That's just the handset. The entire phone wasn't unified into one Bakelite component until Ericsson in Sweden in 1931 in the really beautiful form that Gene Heiberg designed. And I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but Gene Heiberg was a painter and he trained under Henri Matisse from 1908 to 1910. And I just think it's interesting, like anyone who feels like uh, the things you're interested in and the career you're supposed to have don't match, don't worry about it because uh, nobody takes a direct path there. But that phone got everyone interested in creating a similar version for their country. So there are versions of Bakelite phones from the same time period being developed around the world. In England, the 200, which came out in 1929, was a Bakelite phone, but the ringer was in the hallway. And then by 1937, they also could produce a unified one unit piece. There are so many things that are interesting about these phones. I love that they have pull out address books. So we think that our, our iPhones having our contact information right where we need to use it to make a call is in advance. Um, I don't, I just think it's a different version. Also, these were s introduced in service by the British Postal Office because at that time, written communication and verbal communication were all considered communication. And I think that's an interesting model we could think about going back to someday. In America, we had a phone that looked very much the same, but was actually cast die cast zinc from 1937 to 1941, and then made out of a thermoplastic, a, a, a Bakelite sort of plastic after that. And it was in use all the way till 1958. So really, really successful phone. We will look a lot more at this phone when we look at Henry Dreyfus in the future, because this is there's a complicated story about the design of this phone, but also it helps us really understand the early thinking about ergonomics and understanding human measurements. Uh, you may be wondering why we made it in zinc in America. We had such good manufacturing for metal that to reinvent how we made things for Bakelite wasn't worth doing. But the production time difference is pretty radical. It would take about a week to make all the parts for the housing of a phone in metal. And it took a matter of five or six hours to cast it in Bakelite. So it took us a while to get on board, but we did eventually. In this period, we also see the arrival in full force of aluminum. Aluminum had been around since the 1820s, but in its early days, it had to be removed from the ore chemically. It can't be smelted, it can't be melted out because aluminum, I think we talked about this already, but I can't remember. Aluminum m turns to a gas close enough to its melting point that smelting has to be a very controlled experience. So it's generally removed from the ore form chemically in the 1820s and 30s, and then eventually with electricity, but with batteries. So that wasn't such a great process. It wasn't really until the 19 teens and 1920s that electricity and aluminum made a great combination and we were able to produce it in volume uh, affordably. So there are lots of designers starting to use aluminum. We're gonna look at that a lot more in the future as well. I just wanted to let you know in this time period, aluminum arrives. And I'm gonna use that to go off-roading a little bit. The other thing is, in class, I'm super worried about ending on time, and I hope you've been impressed by my ability to do that. But sitting alone in my own house, um, in isolation, 
I, I don't care. I'll just keep talking. Uh, also, you don't need to know about Laurel Giles. He is not a designer that many of you will encounter, but his work is absolutely everywhere and very crucial to our understanding of how industrial design developed as a profession and as an activity. But I also think that looking at his work really helps explain the birth of industrial design and what kind of changes were involved. A lot of designers were having the same equation happen. So looking at his work helps us understand this equation. Objects at this time were shifting from merely utilitarian objects that no one really ever considered aesthetically to objects that had to be considered. Part of that again was the intense competition in the 19, early 1920s, but a lot of it was also the intense competition of the depression. Manufacturers were having to find new ways to appeal to, to customers who didn't really have money to spend. Laurel Guild was hired by a number of companies to update their what they were producing to enter the modern age. And he was really adept at it. And he was adept at it because he had a vast collection of antique objects. So he understood the craft era that we've been talking about for weeks and that iterative process of craftsmen learning where the handle had to be through failure, which does not work in manufacturing. When you're an industrial designer and producing thousands of something, you have to have that handle in the right place in your drawing. So Laurel Guild was able to do this, not through iterative process, but on the first try, because he had a huge library of other people's objects to sort of play with. And he really intentionally made that transition from the craft world to the production world in some interesting ways. There's a whole long list of companies that before the Great Depression only sold materials that then had to bring in designers to figure out how they could also sell objects. And Laurel Guild was a big part of that. He worked for Alcoa to help them transition from just selling the raw material to selling objects made of through their uh, a couple of their different divisions. And that's the depression era business model. Diversify your product line. That way all the different parts of your business can help float the others over difficult times. If I were, if we were in class right now, I've rolled out of the picture. Because if we were in class, we could all enjoy looking at the big one and the little one and these coffee makers. And you think that you have to go to Dave's to get a fancy 2020 pour over, but that's exactly what this device is. It has micro perforations at the bottom that drip the water very slowly over the coffee, which has micro perforations on the bottom, it goes into the pot. And then when you're done, you take that equipment out and the lid fits and you have a very beautiful little pot of coffee. Anyway, none of that matters. I figure nobody's still watching at this point, so I should, I should be as entertaining as possible. Um, he also designed for uh, Chase Copper and Brass. So this is another company that before the Depression made electrical components and sheet metal, brought him in to also then make lamps and cooking equipment and other things. Uh, International Silver, which is not a silver company, they made silver plate. So that's another depression era story. How can we elevate the perceived value of what we're making? Also end up exhibiting his sort of unique blend of old objects and old ways of making things or old ways things should look with new technologies and new prices. So anyway, that's Laurel Gild. You don't have to know him, but I think his story is so fits so neatly into what everyone was trying to figure out how to do at this time period. If I get back to materials, there are a couple of others that I want to mention. This race for laboratory made plastics opened up other doors. Quick drying solvents, which were cellulose based lacquers, were developed in the early 20s for the automobile industry to be able to make cars faster and have the paints dry faster. And then that could be repurposed by designers to do other things. So Donald Desky made some incredible folding screens that are all about being shiny because they're taking advantage of these cellulose based lacquers. The Art Deco period was shiny for a lot of reasons. Bakelite, polished molds, cellulose lacquers, also an expanded ability to use glass. Structural glass came along and transformed a lot of architectural surfaces, both inside and outside. I don't know if you recognize the picture on the upper right-hand corner, but it's Fane's, which is right on Main Street, uh, just north of the Provwash building. So when you get back here, check it out. Anytime there's new material, like structural glass, 
Designers are the people who test the limits of it and see where it can go. So there was this whole craze to take structural glass and do other stuff with it. Here are three, I think, pretty remarkably beautiful chairs exploring what glass can do as a chair component. In a more down-to-earth way, structural glass and glass tiles could also really transform bathrooms. There was a whole craze that I was supposed to talk about last week with Wanamakers, and I ran out of time, to transform the bathroom to make it hygienic, to make people afraid of germs by, by turning everything white. And in the Art Deco period, that takes a, a subtle turn and everything becomes easy to clean and shiny and smooth, but a riot of colors by using tinted glass and color-backed glasses. Also at this time, plumbing got standardized. Indoor plumbing was not new. It became more widespread in the Art Deco period, but more than anything, it became an industry and the parts were standardized and they're all shiny chrome. The bathroom fixtures, the sinks, the porcelain, is all shiny. So lots and lots of shiny things happening in bathrooms because of new materials and new uses for existing materials. Also, laboratory plastics really take off when we start to mature into the later 30s and get some better examples. Polymethyl methyl acrylate, PMMA, which you probably know as plexiglass or acrylic, was invented by a couple of people simultaneously, which is why there are different company names attached to it. Uh, and just as a piece of trivia, Plexiglass with a capital P and one S is the trade name made by Roman Haas, but we now call it all Plexiglass, which is a small P and two S's at the end. Whatever, Matthew, who cares? Um, they figured out the material, but no one knew what to do with it. So Rome and Haas hired some artists to try some stuff. Uh, there's a, an acrylic violin and I don't know what the other instruments are, a recorder maybe and a flute. Not practical, certainly, probably didn't sound great, but really, really interesting ways to exhibit the new material. Where it actually did end up being used was in jelly bellies, which were small pieces of costume jewelry because it looked so much like carved quartz. So it ended up looking like a really high-end craft material, but it was a, a new lower-end laboratory material. The introduction of... of Plexiglass had a bumpy start because it was it was discovered and invented and distributed right before World War II started. So someone like Gilbert Rohde, whom we'll look at more later, uh, could really test the limit of where that material could go and what it could be used for. Put it on a chromed tubular steel base and you get a really innovative chair. But then it was all requisition for the war effort because we realized that we didn't really need transparent chairs, we needed bomber noses. So it was a big part of the war effort, but it didn't end up being used in design until a little bit later. And just because there are five of you still watching and you want to see this, and I love you and I want you to see it, uh, here is a GM Pontiac Deluxe 6 made of acrylic on view at the uh, 1939 World's Fair. It was made specifically to show off what plexiglass could do, but more than that, how incredible a GM car could be. It was called the Ghost Car. And it just sold in 2011 for $300,000, which is way more than I would ever pay for a car or will be able to pay for a car. But it doesn't seem like that much considering there was only ever one transparent car made. Eat your heart out, Wonder Woman, with your transparent plane that never existed. So also in this period, some technologies didn't change all that much. But we start to see the second generation of the objects develop. And there's no better person to talk about to illustrate this than Walter Dorwin Teague. If we were in class right now, I would want you to start this chapter with a totally fresh brain because he's so important and so interesting. Um, so we would have taken a break, but since you're watching this in an airplane or in bed or, I don't know, on the toilet, we don't need a break. So what it means is you don't get to watch a Josephine Baker movie uh, or a car being loaded onto a steamship You'll have to do that on your own. I'm going to charge ahead because I'm inexhaustible and I've had coffee and talk about Walter Darwin Teague. So, hey, by the way, press pause. Take a break anytime you want. I won't know. I don't care. The camera on the upper left is the brownie camera that we looked at last week, the camera that sort of changed camera technology and photography and made it available to everyone. Teague was brought into Kodak to start designing cameras that were actually considered as objects. He redid the brownie to make it into something that would appeal to people as a gift. 
So make it more decorated, make it more than a, a merely utilitarian tool. That's why that camera isn't all that interesting. He did a, a plate on the front that was decorated, changed the color, moved some of the features around a little bit. But the baby brownie on the right, which is made of plastic, is really wonderful design. And I have one right behind me on the shelf. I'll switch back to me so you can see it. Um, I'll describe it. It has, the form is beautiful. The indents on the side, which are part of that form, also function as a really nice handle. Either hand can use it. The stripes that go around it are there to make it look art deco and shiny. But you all know from molding things, uh-oh, how do I open it? There we go. Uh, that also plastic likes to move as it cures. The ridges increase the thickness of the plastic in a way that will help it not only uh, maintain its rigidity while curing, but it will help the two parts register and slide together better. So one of the things I love about this is just how adorable and cute it is and how small it is and how the viewfinder pops up. Uh, but also, it's a real triumph of understanding the new materials and letting the aesthetic come out of that. Walter Dorwentig wrote, Beauty is an outward evidence of inward rightness. I hope you were paying attention enough when we talked about the shakers to realize how like the shakers that idea is. If you get your stuff sorted out on the inside, the outside's going to be okay. I mean, that's true of everything. It's true of manufacturing and design, psychology, um, packaging, lots of things. Teague moved from Indiana to New York in 1902, where he was a sign painter. He did illustrations for mail order catalogs and commercial magazines. He went to Europe in 1926 and discovered Le Corbusier's work and decided to come back and start manufacturing things for production, for manufacturers. And that's another classic aspect of early American industrial designers. Seeing the avant-garde in Europe and realizing that American manufacturing plus a little bit of European design savvy would make a powerful equation. He opened Walter Dorwin Teague Associates in 1926, and it was one of the earliest firms working. Teague wrote, modern design entered the American home not through the front door, but by way of the kitchen, bathroom, and garage. And I'm sorry there's no picture to go with this. I, I didn't get my act together in time. That's a really big idea. Most people are not willing to accept a radical new aesthetic, but if it does something useful for you, you're gonna overlook it. So people who wouldn't have embraced modernism in their living room or in their bedroom would get a new stove or a new refrigerator or a new car or a, a, a toilet that flushed better. So it was how designers could introduce a more radical new aesthetic to people by focusing on utilitarian objects. Teague was contacted by Kodak in 1927, and he ended up designing cameras for them for the next 30 years. So the pictures on the upper left are not by him. That's the autographic that he was given and sort of asked to reimagine. And at the bottom is an actual drawing he did. It's really, really hard for me to show you process with these early designers because a lot of their archives uh, don't contain their original sketches. Uh, so here's an actual drawing Teague did. I love how many of the early industrial designers were illustrators. So as a result, their drawings are quite, quite wonderful. Uh, and on the right is the version of that camera that he designed that fit with the line of brownie cameras that I showed you earlier. But where the work really gets interesting is when he shifts to the, the sort of second generation of things. The plastic cameras, again, have the ribbing for strength. I have one of those here too. But you're, you don't need to see me showing you cameras. I have a Bantam here too, in its beautiful box. The packaging is so, 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 so nice. Uh, and again, this has ridging, it has ridges across it, which give it grip. It's not gonna slip out of your hands because plastic is slippery otherwise. Press the button and it opens so the lens is protected. He's changed the orientation so instead of being vertical, it can also be horizontal a little bit more easily. Um, and that ridging also gives this plastic rigidity so that the parts all fit together neatly. Don't you wish we were meeting in person and you could try that? There's also the, this one, you rotate the lens and it has multiple threads parallel to each other so it opens in one twist instead of 64 twists. It's really fun. I promise I'll still have them next year. You can play with them. Uh, 
And then the camera on the right is a very high-end metal version. It's enameled metal. And the metal banding is actually molded in uh, to protect the enamel and to stabilize that shape. So there's a really nice relationship between the textures and the forms and the material use. Teague also wrote, style is authentic only when it appears as the result of a sincere concentration on the essential factors of our problems. So solving a problem is a way to create form. Teague designed several models of streamlined porcelain clad Texaco stations. By 1940, there were 500 of these. By 1960, there were over 20,000 of these throughout America and actually worldwide. So we're going to look more later at the design of the gas station as a designed object. This is not architecture anymore. It's a prefabricated building system. So it is tipping into, is it architecture? Is it industrial design? I'm especially interested in the furniture he designed for this. You could have multiple bays. You could have the overhang over the pumps, but also you could have office furniture that matched and it was durable and inexpensive. So when we look at the Bauhaus furniture in a couple of weeks, I want to revisit this desk so you can compare American manufacturing to Bauhaus innovation. Teague worked with Boeing from 1946 on. He designed the Stratocruiser's passenger aircraft interior. And it's so charming to look at this picture on the right and imagine traveling that way. Some of you are on airplanes right now watching this, and I hope you wish you were in this picture instead. But remember that we were inventing what airplanes should look like. We didn't know what the type was yet. So maybe it should be a, a lounge with plush seats. In fact, yes, it should be. Uh, Teague went on to design the interiors of the 707, 737, 747, 777, and 787. Really, really long career with airplanes. In fact, the Teague company still works with Boeing. There is a beautiful article that I will post on the Tumblr page for you that these images came from that explained Teague's effort to build a full-size model of this airplane in New York City in a huge factory. And Boeing fought, him against, fought against this because it was very, very expensive. It cost $500,000 and Boeing didn't want to pay for it. So I, Teague had to negotiate a, a way to get that to happen. But he realized that if he just uh, designed it and didn't test it, it wouldn't it wouldn't work correctly. It wouldn't be a good design. And testing it didn't just mean looking at how it look appeared or sitting in the chair for a minute. You had to sit in the chair for 10 hours. What would it feel like to sit in this chair for 10 hours? Not just what would it feel like to sit in the chair for 10 hours. What would it feel like to sit in the chair for 10 hours while the whole thing was shaking, while there was noise, while you were trying to drink? So this is a fully functioning interior of an airplane with electronic simulators and mechanical simulators so that they could actually test it in use while they developed it. And that's a really beautiful example of early industrial designers inventing the way process happened. So we'll look at that a lot more in a few weeks. Teague was a little bit older than the other industrial designers. He had more experience under his belt and in his rearview mirror. So when he wrote his book in 1940 called Design This Day, I think he had a slightly more thoughtful approach than many other industrial designers who also wrote books in the same time period. In it, he quantifies all the components of design. It's not, you will not want to read it. The whole book is difficult to read, but there are some beautiful discussions in it. Uh, there's a lovely discussion of the importance of form and how to arrive at form by intent when you're starting from scratch instead of the craft tradition where you do iterative things. And he was really the first person that I've found at any rate who wrote about that shift from craft iteration to design uh, in, in one process production. So if you're interested in that, you'll want to read this book. Uh, I suggest checking it out of our library at RISD because somebody who read it uh, put a cheat sheet in the back of where the good parts are. I, I don't know who could have done that. And uh, maybe you can use that. One of the things he wrote is the solution of any problem is good only for that problem. But the method of working out the solution may have a lot to teach us. And I love that because uh, a lot of times designers think they've solved the problem and then that whole project goes away, but it's actually the process of solving the problem that, that builds our design muscles. So when you're frustrated in your other studio classes, if some teacher's giving you a stupid project that you don't like, it's not about the outcome of the project, it's about the process of going through it. 
Um, so remember that and have some patience for those frustrating processes. I only gave you about 5% of the story of materials that I wanted to give you, but know that at the time there's a total cultural obsession with new materials and new technologies. In the same way there is now, like how many of you got a new iPhone, not because you needed a phone, but because it had three cameras or some feature you wanted. Uh, we still do that. And that's something that dates probably back much, much farther, but became a part of how we function in the Art Deco period. People became so obsessed with technology that man as technology became the obvious next step. So you may think it's crazy of me to put the slide in and say robot. I want you to think robot when you think the Art Deco period, but it's a really big part of the collective sort of conversation about what happens when you're using machines, when you're making machines, when you're surrounded by machines, are you dehumanized in some way? We'll look at this a lot more when we look at car manufacturing as well, but for now I'm just showing you a couple of examples. If you haven't seen the film Metropolis, you have to see it. You are so lucky, you're the first generation that has Metropolis in an understandable form. When it was released, it was way too long and it came from Germany and it was a silent film and so everywhere it went, different countries cut it up and used different parts of it. And when I first saw it, it was a re-edited version where the narrative didn't make any sense and the music had been recreated. And in the last 10 or 15 years, more sections of it have been discovered. And there's a beautiful project where they found the original script, the original score, re-recorded the music, put the pieces we have back together, and then the screen goes dark for anything we know is missing and you're, you have a description of what's happening. So as a result, the actual original narrative is there and it's really compelling. It's, a par it's parallel worlds where there's workers and the people who own everything and how the machine is affecting life and dividing things. And I think it has a lot of resonance for where we're still living with technology today. Anyway, sorry, that took a long time. This lecture is gonna take 64 hours. But look at these other things too, like the robot was everywhere. Techno Crazy is the stupidest game. It's a wooden board with wooden pegs. I don't think it's fun to play but I wanna play it because there's crazy fighting robots on the cover. The uh, cereal on the top is just a breakfast cereal, but it shows a robot man sucking his fuel source right out of the oil pump and the tagline underneath says, the best gasoline for the human engine. So that was a, a, a romp through materials and technology. Another really important chapter in disseminating the Art Deco style, but also understanding the world that came from, is travel. After World War I, there was a golden age of travel, and travel stopped being something for only the very wealthy and started to be available to many more people. We had better machines, we had better connections between the machines, we had a travel system in place. So the image on the right shows the Art Deco triumph of taking a train right to the boat, so you could get from Paris to New York without having to bother with uh, roadways or or changing modes of transport. The image on the left is from last week. It's the Art Nouveau era steamship experience where all of the travel posters are contrasting modernity and huge ships with some sort of local, colorful, regional culture. So they tip into racism where they're all sort of othering people, uh, but they're starting to speak of the exotic and an interest in the exotic, although in a very objectified way. In the Art Deco period, we're starting to immerse ourselves in the experience of encountering the exotic. So the, the equation changes a bit, and the, I think the graphics and the design involved do as well. Technological advances always happen in times of war, and we talked about this a few times so far this semester. It's tragic, but it's true that we're really only smart when something's trying to kill us. I, I, I hope that becomes very familiar very soon um, for all the right reasons. In World War I, there was so much technical sophistication developed that after the war that could all get repurposed. So for the war, we figured out how to have machine guns that could shoot 300 rounds a minute, how to have submarines with multiple fuel source engines that could use uh, diesel electric combination. So diesel power on the surface and electric battery power underneath the water. Uh, we figured out how to drop a lot of bombs really fast and I'm even more interested in the idea that we figured out how to match gearing so that a propeller rotating very fast and a machine gun firing very fast wouldn't 
hit each other. So you could fire your machine gun through your propeller and the gearing prevented that from being a disaster. So all of that progress ended up changing things after the war. During World War I, wood and fabric biplanes gave way to metal monoplanes, and that was a big advance. Uh, in 1920, McDonnell Douglas Cloudster was the first plane that was able to carry a load that exceeded its own weight. We don't have time for me to do the lighter than air travel chapter of this talk, but I am going to post it separately because I think you'd be really interested in that chapter. Uh, we thought Zeppelins and airships were going to be the right way to travel. World War I helped us realize that heavier than air travel was actually going to become possible. It didn't really come to fruition until World War II, but World War I got the conversation going in a way that the Art Deco period was infused with an enthusiasm for airplanes. The age of air travel was certainly on the horizon. It was really influential, it was really inspiring. It just wasn't quite ready for passengers. So Lindbergh in 1927 flew from Long Island, New York to Paris and won a $25,000 prize. It took him 33 hours and 30 minutes. He went 133 miles an hour. So again, not that long before this chapter, we were looking at trains that could go 36 miles an hour. Suddenly we're going 110 miles an hour uh, and up to 133. So that's going to inspire a lot of people. In fact, the picture on the left is really telling. 20,000 people showed up to see his plane when it landed in Paris. The Doe X flying boat, which is through the lens of, of history, such a charming looking object, uh, was really cutting edge technology. It was the most powerful plane that had been produced in 1929. It could hold 169 people. It could fly for 40 minutes and it could go 105 miles an hour. It's a flying boat, it lands on the water because we didn't really have great landing gear for something that heavy. So it took off and landed uh, water-based. But it really wasn't fully functioning yet. So if it had to make a dramatic turn left or right, people had to get up from one side of the plane and move to the other side to help it bank. But really quickly, we were starting to advance what airplanes could do. So on the lower left is 1939, the first turbojet powered flight, which was 375 miles an hour. That speed was exciting, but also look at that form. Everything had to change because forms like that suddenly existed in the world. And on the lower right is a production airplane, the Ford, Ford Trimotor, which helped make passenger air travel possible. Not very far, it, there were short trips, but we were starting to get air travel and air mail and change the way we were moving around. Also last week we looked at how we got big steel ships and how Atlantic crossings were reduced from weeks to just five or six days. And I talked about how we didn't have a way to best that time. We were stuck at five to six days. So boat makers started to look, boat makers, ship builders started to look at how the equation could change. So it was more about the size and the luxury and the commodities that were available on the, the, the trip. It was more about the experience. And that really ramps up in the Art Deco period because a lot of those Art Nouveau era ships are still in operation after World War I. And they're almost as fast as the newer ones. So, you know, maybe it takes half a day longer than any ship they could build that would be new. So style starts to become the, the equation. Why would I go on the Kaiser Wilhelm that looks like my grandmother designed it if I could go on the Normandy. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do that back and forth again. Like that's the Art Nouveau era opulence. That's the Art Deco period. So luring customers became an exercise in a stylistic exercise. And that's a real design equation. That's the way we, we sort of think about design still. Also think about prohibition happening. In, uh, in the United States, it was 1920 to 1933. The government said no drinking. But once you get out into international waters on a ship going to Paris, for example, prohibition doesn't exist anymore. So there's a whole other culture involved in these trips as well. I'm only showing you a couple of these, but the Normandy is one you need to know about because it's the most incredible. It was 1,029 feet long, weighed almost 80,000 tons, and it could go 30, 32 knots, so pretty fast. But what distinguished it was the level of luxury in the decor. These are... Uh, reverse painted glass panels that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York now that were in the first class salon at on the Normandy. 
This ship cost $60 million to build in 1932, and that translates to a billion dollars today. It was called France's floating national debt. It was so expensive to build uh, that everybody wanted to see it, to get on it, to ride it. Uh, it was subsidized by the government, and that was part of the equation at this time. Every country needed to have an Art Deco masterpiece ship of some kind and have it photographed in front of New York City, which is a, a really lovely equation. It's also true for airships and zeppelins. There's always New York City in the background uh, because it tells the story of arriving at, at the, the sort of the most modern city in the world in the most modern method of transportation from England, from Europe. And when you were going on that country's ship, you were immersed in that country's version of Art Deco. So this is the Queen Mary, which is Britain's version of Art Deco. And you can see it's a little bit different looking than the French version, but the ship was the same, same weight, same size, and almost the same speed. And all of the components of the equation of Art Deco that we've looked at so far are part of these interiors. They're celebrating verticality. They're using new materials. There were thousands of feet of formica in the Queen Mary. Uh, their shiny surfaces, horizontal banding. The whole culture of travel and the equipment for travel was a really important part of how people started to define themselves. So not everybody could afford the most luxurious methods of transport on the Normandy, on the Queen Mary, but everybody was aware that traveling became a sort of public experience and a public expression of yourself. There's this beautiful ad for uh, Louis Vuitton in 19 1921 that translates to show me your luggage and I'll tell you who you are, right? If you don't have Louis Vuitton, you're probably not worth knowing. Uh, and this film on the upper left is a vintage film of somebody taking their car on a, on a ship to go to Europe. Because remember, there wasn't a, enterprise rent a car. There wasn't a uh, Lyft or Uber. If you were going to go driving through France in the summer, you had to take your car with you. So there are still layers of luxury and privilege in involved in this equation. And my apologies, last week, Victor asked me to make sure I talked about uh, the different classes on these ships and for example, what they were eating and, and what kind of experience they would have. And I just, the chaos of this week has derailed my ability to do that. So apologies to you all. But the development of, of luggage for travel had a really long shadow on design in a really weird, wonderful way. Louis Vuitton was at the higher end of this equation, but there were a lot of people making luggage uh, that was super utilitarian. And American manufacturers were especially good at just basic utilitarian, durable luggage. Le Corbusier was incredibly inspired by the functional extremes of steamer trunks. He wrote about it frequently. The wonderful folding out and multiple functions that could fit in these things. The hardware and utility involved in these objects made them beautiful. And that inspired a lot of his thinking about what architecture and design should become. So there's a funny relationship between the, the Art Deco travel and what became European modernism. The same narrative happens with trains as did with ships. Lots of older luxury trains were still around after World War I the Pullman cars, the passenger cars, were just refreshed. They just put some new fabric on stuff. It didn't make them any faster. So all train companies could do is make them more luxurious, make better food, more attendance. Uh, it wasn't about the speed. It became instead about the experience and even more so the destination, the exotic place you were going to arrive at. So many of the trains that were put into service used the old sleeping cars and the old engines and just built a new dining car so you'd have a public Art Deco experience. These are pictures from the train now. It's still in service, the Etoile du Nord, but I don't know if the furniture is authentic. To my eye, it looks strangely wrong. But I wanted to show it to you because if you look on the, the panel, on the wall, it is unbelievably similar to the Roman cabinet I showed you from the 1925 Paris Expo. And that's not an accident. The goal in designing these uh, dining cars was to make them as luxurious as possible. You could go to the 1925 Paris Expo and stay there while it took you to Amsterdam. As the Art Deco ed era advanced, we started to see a really major upgrade in train engines. Coal producing steam power gave way to diesel being used to produce electric power. And that change made trains much lighter, 
We also add to that the ability to use different sheet metals to use stainless steel and aluminum instead of cast iron or rolled iron sheet. And trains could get exponentially lighter, which made them go much faster. So a lot of people credit the speed of these trains to the design and say it's streamlining uh, in action, but actually it's just they were lighter and the tracks were a little bit better. But there is a really beautiful evolution of trains from cast iron industrial revolution era to a modern era streamlined machine. And you can see that really well with, with the Burlington Zephyr. In the 1890s, trains went about 100 miles an hour top speed, although 60 miles an hour was normal. 40 years later, they were only going about 15 miles an hour faster, so they weren't really faster, but boy, did they look faster. Travel started to become not a private luxury experience, but a public expression, a, uh, something that was available to more people. Tra train travel became less expensive. And so the machines transitioned from something that uh, was just a machine to something that was a, a, a decorated, considered aesthetic. I said that wrong, and I hope you caught it. It's not a decorated aesthetic, it's a decorative aesthetic. It's not, uh, there's no decoration applied to it. Its form happens to end up being decorative, and that's modernism in action, which is so exciting to see. We're going to look at Raymond Lowy and Henry Dreyfus all on their own in a couple of weeks and use that as an opportunity to learn about them, but also to learn about the development of the practice of industrial design. But I want to put this one slide in here to show you that lots of trains were having the same equation. Train lines were still privately owned, so there was a lot of competition between the people who owned them, and style started to really matter, as did speed, um, but more than anything, the style and the publicity. So the same equation of redesign from industrial machine to designed machine starts to happen across the board with trains. I want to talk a little bit more about streamlining because it's a word I just threw in a few times, assuming you know what it meant. But I think there's a lot to learn from where it came from and where it went. And also because I just happen to be sitting, it's so convenient this week to be recording this here. Just this year, this device entered my life. It's the travel iron on the screen. It's so cute and small. It's got a Bakelite top, which is insulated, right? It's an insulator. It's got these horizontal bands, which make it look fast, but also provide another layer of insulation between my hand and the heat producing part. And it's a iron that is desperate to be a train. I wish you could see the desk now. It's littered with 1930s. So I want to talk about streamlining because in this era, this obsession with speed really affected what objects looked like, even if they didn't go anywhere. On the left is a travel iron, in the middle is an air compressor, and on the right is a proposal for a vacuum cleaner. They all look pretty much the same, and they do completely unrelated things. And that's not an accident. Reginald Mitchell designed the Supermarine S6B, and it was the first aircraft to go more than 400 miles an hour. So everyone who is alive and found out about this wanted to know more about it. We went from a world that went 15 miles an hour to 36 to 60 to 100, and right out of, out of the blue, overnight, we're going 400 miles an hour. Most of the reason this could happen actually comes from boats, and that's a story that if you're interested in, there's another video on the YouTube channel you can watch about that. But for now, I'm just gonna say, look at that airplane. It's very, very thin sheet metal that's been corrugated down the side, and you all know from Metals One, Sheet metal's flimsy and wiggles around a lot, but if you introduce regular three-dimensional uh, change in its shape, it becomes incredibly rigid. So those stripes are creating the visual horizontal banding that is in so much stuff in the Art Deco period, but it's also giving the metal rigidity. The pontoons below are a closed form that work like a boat hull and help it land and take off from the water, but they're also creating these pod shapes. All of those shapes were really exciting to designers. We were starting to understand the relationship between speed and form. In 1914, McDonnell Douglas started using wind tunnels to test aircraft. And by the 1920s, engineers demonstrated that a teardrop shape reduced wind resistance best and allowed faster speeds and better fuel use. Norman Bel wrote a book in 1932 called Horizons and looked at aerodynamics and streamlining and explained how it could be used in design. And that really did influence a lot of people at the time. 
So I would argue that anything that needed to consider speed is allowed to borrow language from that conversation about functional streamlining. If you're a train, you're not going to actually be able to go that much faster, but you're supposed to suggest speed visually. Same thing with a car, same thing with an outboard motor. That outboard motor made a boat go maybe four miles an hour. So it doesn't need to be considering wind resistance, but you're going to feel like your boat's going faster because that's your motor. And that's a really important thing that design can do for people or to them, depending on your point of view. I might also argue that streamlining tends to produce a smooth outer casing. And that's also really useful in other places. So if you're making a scale for a butcher where every day you need to sterilize it, having a smooth outer casing is going to let you do that better. If you're Raymond Lowy, who's on the right there with his Sears cold spot, and I'm sorry, I don't know who the man on the left is. I have not been able to figure that out. Uh, that's a famous refrigerator redesign that you read about in your reading. We'll look at it more when we look at Raymond Lowy. And it's hard to see in this picture, but it's very thin sheet metal that's been given form and structure and rigidity by bending the edges around a little bit and introducing the vertical stripe down the middle. So taking thin sheet metal and, and, and giving it rigidity and attaching it to an interior frame completely changed how refrigerators were, were made. So that outer housing affected the, the, the manufacturing, reducing the cost, reducing the material use, and also produced an object that was easy to clean. But what happened with streamlining was it kind of jumped the shark. I don't know if you even know the expression jump the shark. Google it. Give yourself something extra to do. Uh, but it, it, it became something everyone had to do and every product had to reference streamlining just because it was so popular. So meat slicer has to go fast. Clock has to look like it can barely even stop to turn the alarm off, right? I mean, that clock is, is changing direction on every axis. That's a three axis clock. The vacuum cleaner looks like it's gonna speed past so maybe that says your vacuuming will happen faster, but really it's just getting you, it's borrowing the excitement of speed and the era and applying it to a vacuum cleaner. And I would argue that the language of streamlining for a circular saw is actually tipping into dangerous. Like you should be cutting faster is a, is a really good door into you should cut your fingers off. And then it's sort of streamliner bust. So on the left is one of the most famous objects from the history of industrial design, and it makes me so angry. It's on the cover of books. It's everywhere. It's a prototype. There was one made. It's Raymond Lowy saying, streamlining's popular. I'll stick it on stuff. Uh, this is a pencil sharpener that's bolted to your desk. So not only does it not need to go fast, I don't think it even needs to look fast. And the form kind of fights against the way it's supposed to be used. So it's a cool looking object, but Hardly something that I want our profession to be remembered for creating. And then on the right is, I'm showing you this because if you ever see one at a flea market, buy it no matter what it costs. They are extremely rare. It's an ice crusher. You put an ice cube in the top and you squeeze the trigger and it puts crushed ice in your cocktail. So perfect for the Prohibition era. Um, but one recently sold at auction for $32,000. So I just, I want to give you some get rich quick schemes and that's one of them. Where were we before that? Streamlining travel. We're talking about travel. So the last entry in my conversation about travel is roads. And this is a really big one that also is very hard for us to imagine because we live in a world that is so interconnected with this network of roads. The whole system of cars exists now, but it had to be invented at this time period. The Lincoln Highway opened in 1959. The US Federal Highway Act was created in 1921, and that provided funding for the building of roads. We also started to construct bridges on a much larger scale. So we've looked at a bunch of bridges before this, uh, much, much smaller. We talked about ferry service to get across water. Uh, suddenly we're getting much bigger engineering because we're using steel. Uh, before the George Washington Bridge, cars were ferried across the Hudson River from New Jersey into New York and back. And we saw Brunel transform the landscape with his train bridges and tunnels, but this is for cars and it's on a much more massive scale. The suspension bridge defines the Art Deco period. Many people talk about the beauty of a suspension bridge and how it helps people understand modernism, that you don't need decoration, that engineering can arrive at beauty. We already know from the things we've looked at this semester that that's been true for a very long time, but it was a really big public way 
for people to understand that story. And also remember that our train networks were almost 100 years old and expensive and difficult to update and maintain, whereas highways were new. So there was an enthusiasm for the road and the highway because they were clear the, the future. I'm sorry there's uh, alarms going off in the background. Also, public transport, uh, private transportation, which we're going to look at next week with, with the Ford Model T, was free from the limitations of train stations and where the, the lines went. You could go where you wanted to go. Personal volition and transportation is a really powerful part of the thrill of the Art Deco period. So, so far, I don't even know if you're still with me. I can't imagine why you would be. But so far, we've done what did the Art Deco style look like? Why did it happen? What I'd like to look at now is how did it spread so completely? And I'm going to go off-roading and show you some stuff that isn't part of industrial design history, but is so important in understanding how style and design interact with everyday lives. In 1928, talking pictures, sound in movies, led to a lot of changes in that entertainment form. We started to get more complex narratives, more sophisticated dramas, more engaged audiences. There were musicals, because you could have sound, you could have music, and they were full of semi-clad chorus girls, illicit sex, glamour, music, dance. These are escapist narratives. And I don't know if you remember all the way back to the beginning of this talk, this was an era that was pretty desperate for an, a method of escaping reality because reality was really dreary. Does that sound familiar? Are you binging and Netflixing more now than you ever did? Are you watching more YouTube videos now than you ever did? Yes, you are because that is the classic equation. You go looking for an escape out of reality when reality is really challenging. Also during the depression, people were really struggling just to make ends meet. You could go to the movies and watch people achieve upward mobility. You were dreaming of it in your own life and you go to the movies and watch it happen. Technology entered this equation in a really exciting way. New plastics, the new celluloids, the new kinds of film, and the new chemicals that could be applied to those films allowed for a higher contrast film. I hope you know from your drawing exercises, and if you don't, give it a try. In class, I would normally ask you this, what do you get when you combine lights right next to darks? And you would all answer, because I know you know the answer, you get shiny. If you're trying to show a shiny surface, you break it up with high contrast areas of light and dark next to each other. So look at how chrome is drawn, look at how glass is drawn, look at how uh, any shiny surface is rendered in an image. And look at this image from Grand Hotel where Greta Garbo is wearing all sorts of new shiny materials. She's probably wearing a, uh, a, a robe that's made of synthetic material, maybe it's rayon, there's glass, there's mirror, there's chrome surfaces. Because the films could show more contrast, the people creating these films knew they could maximize the effect of that by using more shiny surfaces. Hair pomades to make the hair shinier, uh, more contrast in the clothing, more graphic patterns. Also, because the characters could talk, we cared about them more. Because the movies had a story arc, we were concerned for what would happen. We wanted these characters to triumph in the end. We became invested in the people in the movies, and that transferred really quickly to caring about the actors and actresses. Are we ever going to get rid of the word actress? Why is that? That is so terrible to have that gender divide in the one place where you could just get rid of it and it wouldn't matter. Anyway, that's a, that's a complaint for another day. Um, we cared about the actors, so we started to get the, the cult of celebrity. You didn't just go to a movie to see the character, you went to see Greta Garbo or Joan Crawford playing that character. And you didn't just want the dress they were wearing in the movie, you wanted to be them in real life because they were glamorous and successful. So that emulation of celebrity, it exists before this, but it really started to mature as an equation in the Art Deco period. And we are still in the grips of it. Kim Kardashian owes everything she is to Greta Garbo. You can tell her I said so. Um, so before these Art Deco movies, uh, the older movies before sound film had painted backdrops, flat backdrops. Suddenly we're getting three-dimensional sets, we're getting camera movement, and we're getting designers to fabricate them. And that is a really early proto-industrial design job. A lot of the early industrial designers started out as set designers and especially in Hollywood or in the movies. 
Another important part of the movie equation is the immersive experience. So it's just like the department store was for the Art Nouveau period, but times a thousand. This was new technology, so it needed new architecture. We didn't know what a movie theater was. We had to invent it. And then when sound got added, a lot of movie theaters had to upgrade and they took that opportunity to add air conditioning. So these were extremely modern cutting edge machines for gathering and watching entertainment. And they would be built in the newest style. You'd have no reason to build them in an old style. So movie palaces were especially uh, visible expressions of the Art Deco and still are because they're around everywhere. So I have a whole series of them. I used to have about 30 slides of movie theaters around the world. So you could find one from where you live. Here's one in Oakland, California. Uh, by the mid thirties, 80 million people a week in America alone were seeing a movie. And they were doing it in these completely immersive art deco theaters. Every surface looks like it's been lifted out of Paris 1925 and landed in Oakland. And all around the world, you could go to the Philippines, England, Australia, anywhere, and there are different variants, but you will get that same equation of new building for new technology in the new style. Because a few of you had to leave a week early to get back to India, I also wanted to point out that Art Deco in India is incredibly uh, easy to find. There was a lot of development happening there at the time and it has survived, although sometimes hidden underneath a lot of other things. I find it interesting that the Art Deco period was so determined to define modernity and the future and yet was so stuck with historical styles. And I want to explain that a little bit. This is Grauman's Egyptian theater. You're more familiar with Grauman's Chinese theater, which is the one that's always in the, uh, the premieres there all the time now. But look at this building. It is just desperately trying to be a piece of Egypt transported to Hollywood. That's not an accident. This is 1922. In 1922, Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb, and that created a, f a fever for everything Egyptian that you would have trouble believing, and you will have trouble believing, uh, but really was true. Every sort of thing was reimagined in the Egyptian revival style. Look at that picture on the lower right of Howard Carter looking into King Tut's tomb. Do you see what he's sitting on? I hope when this slide came on, you gasped not because you love the Cartier clock or want that jacket, but because you saw what Howard Carter is sitting on, do I have to tell you, it is a Tonnet chair. Michael Tonnet, Germany, 1867. Boom, there it is in King Tut's tomb. Anyway, if you think I'm kidding, everywhere around the world discovered the Egyptian aesthetic in the same way that we looked at with Wedgwood in the 1790s, in the same way that we looked at with Napoleon in the 1820s, but this was much more radical. And every scale of thing from condoms to face powder to uh, Cartier mantle clocks was reimagined to have an Egyptian theme. So of course, an Art Deco theater would be at the cutting edge of design uh, and style by being Egyptian. The best known of these movie palaces is Radio City Music Hall. Opened its doors in 1933, I'm sorry, it opened in 1932, but it started showing movies in 1933. And this theater fit almost 6,000 people, 5,933 seats for spectators. So last week with the 1900 Paris Expo, I mentioned that 10,000 people saw a movie all at the same time and asked you to imagine what it was like to be in a crowd that big having one experience. But suddenly move that inside, there's 6,000 people, and it's with sound, and it's with a show beforehand, uh, and it's with music, and it's with uh, concessions, and it's all immersed in this unbelievably luxurious Art Deco palace. It had a, an organ, a pipe organ, over 4,000 pipes. It was the largest organ in the world at the time. And last week when we looked at Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia, I did not have time to point out the organ there. And the point I wanted to make then was that for all of our history, organs were in churches because it was a way to help celebrate the spirit of God. Suddenly in the Art Nouveau period, when commerce is taking over, we transfer that allegiance and we're not using an organ to celebrate the Holy Spirit of God, we're using it to celebrate the Holy Spirit of commerce. And now in the Art Deco period, we're making another leap and saying that uh, entertainment is our new future. And it still is, we're still in that world. Uh, here's another sloppy chapter transition. 
you need to know more about Donald Desky. One of the struggles I have is there's all these people I want you to know about, and how do you fit them in a smooth narrative? My, my solution is you just don't, you shove them in. So I want to talk about Donald Desky a little bit because you will keep encountering his work, and I think he's a, a, per a person worth looking at. He grew up in Minnesota, he studied architecture, and he was another one of the pioneers of industrial design as a profession. He went to the 1925 Paris Expo. So here's another artist in America, goes to Europe, encounters new ideas, and comes back and transforms the landscape here. So he came back to America really determined to bring Art Deco to America through design activities. He did window displays in New York through the 20s, and he won the competition to design many of the interiors for Radio City Music Hall, uh, many of the public uh, spaces and private offices. I love considering these interiors and comparing them to the 1925 Paris Expo because he's doing a really interesting thing. These don't look at all like that Expo in terms of their surfaces. There's no surface activity, but they do in terms of their celebration of the material and in terms of their geometry and especially in terms of their playing with proportions. So if you think of that Ruhlman interior, this is using a lot of the same tricks to break up your understanding of how big the room is and how tall it is with these really luxurious surfaces that are allowed to just be wood or be metal. They're not transformed into something else. And that opens the door into what becomes the American modern style. I should also point out, which I did last week, but I'll remind you now, we didn't call the style Art Deco until after 1968. And that name came from the Paris Art Deco show, but at the time, there were lots of different names for this style, and in America, we called we tended to call it the modern style or the streamlined style. Desky was all Art Deco all the time, and he really explored how new materials that were available could help advance the cause of the Art Deco style. So he used lots of chrome and glass and shiny surfaces and ribbing, and he designed a lot of lamps. And if you compare these to last week's Art Nouveau lamps by Tiffany, by uh, the, the French glass makers. They were all referencing nature by being mushrooms or uh, dandelions or weeping willows. They weren't certain about how electricity could create light in the home. Suddenly, add Donald Desky, add Bakelite, add chrome surfaces, and it's a really mature equation of what a light could be. There's no reason to care about 1958 yet. We'll do that in a couple of weeks. But he had a really long career with many facets. So I also suggest to any of you who are sort of feeling like you live in between different professions, learn more about how some of these other designers transitioned. He started a graphic design firm called Don Donald Desky & Associates in the 1940s and did much identity work that is still evident in our world today. He did the Crest logo and packaging, the Tide Bullseye, um, the GIF packaging, which sadly is not GIF's packaging anymore, Duncan Hines, lots and lots of corporate identity work that, that really transformed our understanding of our relationship to a corporation and their products. He also designed some very beautiful furniture later on. Uh, he retired at the age of, no, he retired in 1975, but the company is still in operation in Cincinnati. If I get back to the entertainment thread, I want to point out that entertainment was not just in movie theaters. Dance halls were a really important part of how people interacted with each other, how they sought entertainment, and how they learned about new music, which is a big part of the Art Deco period. The craze for speed that was reflected in all the objects I've shown you was also part of dancing. So if we were in class live right now, I'd take a poll, which of these two parties would you rather go to? The dance on the left was really racy for its time, full, full body contact. Lots, it's a naughty, naughty dance, but that was 1924. By 1927, there were some new ideas about what dancing could be. And I'm using this as a clumsy way to talk more about Josephine Baker, because I think in my clumsy effort this semester to look at cultural appropriation and uh, how we might talk about incorporating other people's ideas and cultures better, she's a fascinating case study in self-empowerment through intentional appropriation. So in the same way that Loey Fuller last week used technology and performance art to create a sort of triumph of new forms of entertainment, and I argued that design was a big part of what she did, I would make the same argument with Josephine Baker. She became globally famous 
as an entertainer, but she also realized there was an opportunity to use her celebrity intentionally. So the cult of celebrity that was developing in the Art Deco period was unbelievably mature in her own efforts. On screen, she was promoted as, uh, generally as a heathen who became civilized and uh, famous as a result, or a, a poor waif who somehow accidentally through her own pluck ended up somewhere better. And her movies are really, really interesting and entertaining and worth watching. But she was so famous in real life that she realized she could sell that. So you like my hair? Great, I'll sell you hair products. You like my skin tone? I'll sell you cosmetics. She made a vast fortune uh, and FYI, you know, was twerking before any of us uh, by taking advantage of her own celebrity. So she doesn't belong in our industrial design history class, but you, there's no way to look at the Art Deco period without recognizing her personal impact on it and also how what she accomplished and who she was represented what was going on at the time. So if you have nothing else to do over the next few months, watch every Josephine Baker movie. Also, I want to point out, and unfortunately, I can't demonstrate a, a, a hand crank Victrola for you, but well, I don't know, find one on YouTube and watch it. When you come back, let's have a Victrola party. Portable music was a big part of the Art Deco period. Again, before portable music, you had to either be able to make it yourself or have a Victrola in your house. Suddenly, the idea that you could have a dance party anywhere you went, and these things were loud, was really exciting. They're completely mechanical, 78 speed, hard pressed shellac record with a steel needle. So you might think the technology is unbelievably primitive, but if you got to see it in action, you would be pretty amazed by how exciting it is. And in the Art Deco period, there was an effort to just keep changing these devices to make them ever more portable, smaller, smaller, smaller. So the Thorin's Excel, though, uh, super portable. And it's a fascinating device where the, you bolt the record on and the sound actually comes up below the record and the record helps as part of the amplification system to augment the, the volume. And I've never seen one of these in person, but they're so remarkable. They're, it's a palm-sized, super miniature record player. Re attach this in your brain to the automatons we looked at the first day and all of the Swiss engineering that we were talking about then because it didn't end up ever becoming obsolete. A really big part of this era and another aspect of this desire to escape is the, the need for a party. Remember that Prohibition went on for 13 years. When Prohibition ended in 1933, you better believe that drinking became a really regular part of our society. During Prohibition, it was also a really regular part because it was illicit. Anytime you tell a lot of people they can't do something, they're gonna do it and they're gonna have way more fun doing it. So there was a huge focus in the Art Deco period on the equipment of drinking and the culture of drinking. The picture on the left is the first load of hooch being released legally in New York City in 1933. The pictures on the right are some things that Norman Velgettis' office designed to help people consume more drinks. And that's my clumsy transition to talk to you more about Norman Velgettis. I want to talk about him because many of you will be really, really excited about his work. I am frustrated by it, but I will do my best to be enthusiastic. He was a scenic designer at the New York Metropolitan Opera from 1918 on, and in 1925 he did some work in Hollywood doing set design. He opened his industrial design studio in 1927, so he is also one of the very first people with an office doing industrial design as a profession and helped invent the way we do it. His office designed a wide range of commercial products, cocktail shakers, radio cabinets, but you're gonna like him because he was the first person to do crazy, open-ended concept thinking and combine that with real world designing. So while he was doing cocktail shakers and school desks, he was doing totally discursive, weird uh, design propositions. And I know that that is exciting to a lot of you. He was friends with Ray Graham of Graham Pen... Blah, 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 blah. See, even when I'm alone recording to my computer, I have no command of language. Should I edit that out or leave it in? He was friends with Ray Graham of Graham Page Motor Company and did five brass concept models of cars for him of 
successively more forward thinking cars. Like here's one you could make next year in five years and 10 years and 20 years. So they were blue sky thinking, but attaching it to reality, which is a really rare sort of approach. Uh, and they were meant to be from uh, progressively more radical from 1928 through the, the 30s. None of them was ever built, but the models are pretty exciting. And they, and they were reproduced widely. Bel Geddes was totally unafraid of proposing the future. In 1929, when air travel was still really new, he proposed the airliner number four, intercontinental airliner, that he believed would be in existence by, eight, by 1940. And it was a nine deck amphibian airliner that could hold 451 passengers or about 20 times the capacity of existing planes. It needed 20 engines to fly and it had a 528 foot wingspan. Just for contrast, a 747 has a 212 foot wingspan and Airbus is about 262 feet. So this was bonkers ahead of its time. Um, that's what most people would say, bonkers ahead of its time. I say stupid because it could never be built, but you, you take your pick which, you, which way you want to look at it. Uh, there were areas for deck games, an orchestra, a gymnasium, a solarium, and in the pontoons, in the pods at the bottom, airplane hangars for smaller planes because the proposal was that you would embark and debark uh, through smaller planes flying up to it. But for all of his imaginative prowess, he also did create interiors for real aircraft and helped design passenger cabins and sleeping compartments. Uh, he worked for Glenn Martin and Douglas and was an important voice in helping us figure out what airplanes should be. So the image on the left is going to make you laugh. Like, what's an airplane? Is it a lounge where there's a rolling bar and you keep your baby on your lap? Sure. We didn't know better yet. I really like uh, listening to Bel Geddes rant or reading his rants uh, when he encountered designs that he thought were bad. He went to work for Simmons Steel Bed Company and he was really upset with their approach to using metal to look like wood. They'd stamp it and paint it to look like wood. So the bed in the upper left hand corner is a classic Simmons Steel bed. And his proposals for them all investigated how metal could be allowed to look like metal. Leave it sheet metal and enamel it, use it in tubular form or in rod form and let that create the aesthetic. My favorite product of his is his design for the Magic Chef stove. I have two stoves here. On the left is a, an old gas range and you can understand some of the problems with that uh, and how it was made and how unconsidered it is as an object. On the right is a later version that's enameled and even that one hasn't changed all that much. Bel Geddes did market research and that's something we're going to look at more in a few weeks. That's a big part of what early industrial designers had to invent. How do I even find out what the redesign should consider? So he did market research and the primary consideration in, in people buying new stoves was ease of cleaning. So pretty quickly he realized he could just use large rectangular panels of enameled steel in place of cast iron and remove all the decorative handles and done. You have a stove that's instantly easier to clean. So that relationship between asking the, the consumers what they needed and finding a way to incorporate that, that into the design, it's so obvious to us, but it's something that had to be figured out. I also love that one of, the, one of the later concerns was, and see if this sounds familiar to you, like you're at the movies and you think, did I turn the stove off? So the top panel on the stove, in addition to making it easy to clean, lifts up and slides down behind the stove. And when it's open, you can use the burners. When you lift it and put it back down, it turns all the gas off. So if you closed the lid, you've turned the stove off. You can also turn it off with the knobs, but Bel Geddes knew that that forcing your body to do a motion is the thing you can remember. So if you're at the movie theater saying, did I turn the stove off? You can go, oh yeah, I remember closing it. Also, his, the book, one of the books he produced has some of his early process and it's really satisfying to look at. He rationalized the different stoves they made and realized that they had far more components, individual and unique, than they needed. If you rationalize those pieces into building blocks, you could then combine them to make an apartment stove, a house stove, uh, a family stove, a hotel stove, all different size uh, cooking devices with the same components. He also introduced the wire pull-out rack. Racks didn't pull out before that. So I thank him every time I 
don't burn something in my oven because I can pull it out quickly. Today, Belgettis is best remembered for designing the General Motors Pavilion, known as Futurama, at the 1939 World's Fair. This is a World's Fair that I should talk more about, but you'll just have to collage together the times I reference it. It was created by industrial designers to imagine the future. So there's a lot of components that you'll want to know about. The GM Pavilion showed a panorama of superhighways and teardrop-shaped cars of the future in 1960. Using all of the material that he developed for this, he published a book called Magic Motorways in 1940, which became an inspiration for post-war freeway and interstate highway systems. He wrote, there should be no more reason for a motorist who is passing through a city to slow down than there is for an airplane which is passing over it. And so a lot of what he was proposing as the future wound up becoming our future, partly because he did a good job imagining it, and partly because he understood where it was going anyway, and he just uh, gave us better tools to sort of understand that. He was imagining the motorist of 1960, and in Futurama you can see the clover leaf, so an elevated and depressed roadway, so the transition from one to another is more graceful. Uh, the spaces between the cars are maintained by sensors and curved sides to the road, so that the cars are sort of contained. There's regular car transport and truck transport to get commercial traffic out of the way. All sorts of ideas were proposed in here that came true, but many more did not come true. He also produced a book that I mentioned earlier called Horizons in 1932, which is where some of his process images came from. It's more of a gripe about how many of his designs didn't get realized than it is a, a a book that you'll enjoy reading, but if you're interested in his work, there's a lot more information about his projects and his thinking in that. I also have a much longer video about him on the YouTube channel if you want more information. I love this slide because it points out that before Photoshop, there still was a world. We were still innovative before 3D printing. This is a proposal that Belgettis made for a flying car where you land and then fold the wings up, and it's a model, and it's being suspended on a stick or by wires over a landscape and it looks so realistic that some of you are not listening to me right now and just imagining that it happened. In 1944, Belgettis was one of the 15 founders of the Society of Industrial Designers, SID, which became the IDSA later. So I just wanted to give you a little bit more about him um, in this zone. I hope this whole time you've been sort of thinking that there's a confusion in my narrative. Some of the stuff I've talked about is manufactured, is the future, is modernism. You understand as a transition object between the old ways we did things and the ways we do things today. But a lot of the things I showed were also very high-end, probably limited production or one-of-a-kind objects that are not all that different in why they exist than anything we've looked at yet this semester. Might as well have been a tapestry for King Louis. Because we're still just arriving at an, the ability to translate these high-end aesthetics into more broadly consumable products. We're just starting to get new materials like plastics and aluminum and stainless steel and new technologies like smaller electric motors that open door for designers to really start changing objects and changing the lives of people who use those objects. So the Art Deco period was a time of some really interesting struggles where manufacturing and new materials were trying to get working better and designers were trying to make them work better for us, but right on the brink of combining aesthetics and manufacturing to really enter the modern age. The simplicity and the geometry and the surface treatments and materials that were so popular in the Art Deco style really lent themselves to production. So once we started to figure out manufacturing and production better, it was a really gentle and graceful slide into that without the style having to change a lot. By this time, manufacturing and distribution, which we've looked at for the last two weeks, were, were all in place. Learning how to get it all working together with manufacturing was starting to happen. And the depression created this really active demand for new styles, for less expensive goods, and that required design and designers. So the birth of industrial design as we know it happened in this time. We'll look more at that in a few weeks when we look at Lowy and, and Dreyfus. And I hope you remember the first day when I showed the timeline of everything we'd be looking at, and there was that big explosion that happened during the Industrial Revolution. 
And I showed you when industrial design as a profession started, and it seemed confusing because there was no change in our, the trajectory of our technology or progress. So that's why it was actually a change in commerce and economics and manufacturing that allowed craftspeople to turn into designers. So hopefully that was an introduction to the style of Art Deco that was useful, but also an investigation of some of the reasons it happened that will help set us up for the next couple of weeks. So next week, I promise to do a better job doing digital delivery. I don't know how, maybe it won't be better, but I'm gonna try. Uh, it will be certainly more time to prepare it for you. We're not gonna look at objects next week. I'm stepping out of the, the stream of history because I wanna spend a week looking at efficiency and manufacturing and the really interesting beginnings of understanding how to understand the limitations of our bodies and get that knowledge working for us. So how did we start to understand manufacturing and how did that end up becoming an examination of understanding ourselves better as machines? I'm also gonna try and get this little sub chapter recorded for you because it's timely. There was just an exhibition in Paris uh, there's more information available, but for me, there's this really lovely chapter that helps sum up the Art Deco period and bring India into the conversation in a more vibrant way, uh, and also look at colonialism and oppression and all the things that I think are worth considering in this chapter that we've left out so far. So look for that. I'll try and get it done and let you know about that. I can't believe you stuck with me. I actually don't think anyone is still listening. Um, but at any rate, I said it at the beginning. Um, I'm really sorry that things have devolved to the point where this is the way we're doing it, but I'm really in many ways grateful that we have such an easy transition to this other format. Most of your other classes are really going to struggle to figure out how to turn digital. This class is pretty easy. I hope that you were doing something else while watching this and as a result, you didn't even miss the experience of being crammed in a hot classroom uh, and watching me struggle. Okay. Okay, bye. See you. See you when I see you. <laughs>